Hi guys. Uh, hi guys. I think we're pretty much there, so I might as well get started. Give you guys a little bit more time at the end if you need to ask any questions or be anywhere else. Um, I'm Hugh Williams, and I'm here to talk to you about Joomla SEO. Um, basically, going through keyword research, why it's important. Talk a little bit about competitor analysis, uh, then move on to talk about how you can go about migrating a website from a different platform or upgrading an existing website uh, that's on the Joomla platform or redesigning it and improving the SEO and on-site optimization. Uh, if I get time, I might have a quick chat uh, about the kind of off-site optimization, but uh, I'm sticking to on-site mainly in this presentation. Um, basically, a little bit about ourselves. Um, we're the 3B Digital team. Uh, my co-team here on the right. Uh, we're a full service agency from London in the UK and we deal pretty much exclusively with Joomla web development. Um, I tend to be in charge of the search engine optimization work and email marketing and we've got a couple of talks on Sunday from Jack, one of the main partners who deals with most of the implementation and we've got Jordan who's our, our main developer. And quite a lot of what we're going to be talking about today will tie in with Jack's talk on Sunday about how to make sure you launch websites correctly uh, to kind of head, try and head off any problems you may have. Okay. Right, so just to start with, I'm going to run through uh, a couple of options uh, that you might be faced with as a developer uh, when you get given either, surprise, surprise, a completely brand new startup business which gives you a great blank canvas to work from. Um, so obviously there you have to go through actually setting up the domain with them, uh, choosing the right domain name, which is important, doing the basic research, helping them to work out exactly where they fit into the marketplace. Um, I'm then going to look at how you would go about using, a, uh, using this research that you need to carry out for any kind of website redesign or development process for an existing client uh, who's come to you and wants a new website and talk about how you go about auditing a website um, and how you go about then redirecting those links to ensure that things are working, working where they should be and a couple of notes that we've come across in our own experience about migrating content. Uh, I'll then talk a little bit about how you can ensure that things go right and that the website appears in the search pages uh, without duplicate content and those kind of things as finishing touches and I'm just going to summarise what I've run through with you today and uh, give you a quick brief view of some of the tools that we use and then obviously take any questions at the end. Alright, so first up, a new startup has come to you. Uh, they don't have a domain name, they might have a company name. Uh, what do you do? Where do you go from there? Well, first off, you'll want to have a sit down with them and any of the key stakeholders in the business and possibly brainstorm a set of keywords that surround their business and their products and their brand and kind of work out mutually between yourselves obviously with some of your own influence to what you feel would be a good choice um, and get the domain name organised. Now obviously you want it to be unique, you don't want it to be too similar to any of the competitors' domain names. Uh, you want to try and make it easy to type and easy to remember. Uh, our general rule is as short as possible um, and try not to include any special characters, hyphens and numbers if you can avoid them. Um, are not a good choice. Um, once you've got that sorted, um, and as it's the key thing, you know, it's, it's almost like our passports or driving license um, for a website of an online brand. It's the key thing to get sorted, so you want to do that right. Uh, after you've got that organised, obviously hosting's next up. It's an obvious thing, we all know about it as developers. We know that clients need it. Um, clients quite often don't understand hosting or why they need it, or why it's important. So I find it's helpful um, to kind of hold their hand through that process. But as a developer, you want to be aware that speed is important, not just for search engines. Um, it's also important for user experience. You need a fast website. There's lots of stuff you can do after the case for optimization and keeping it all nice and tidy, but speed is important. Uh, reputation is also important, not just of the hosting company themselves, but if you can try and work out with them the best way of avoiding, if budget allows being stuck in a shared server with sort of 50 or 60 other websites, um, because that can, in fact, if any of those get hacked or broken or get compromised and send out spam, that can actually come back and affect your client. 
um, in the long term, uh, especially if they get blacklisted as a servant wide level. Um, and you also need to think about headroom uh, in the hosting package. So you want to be able to provide your client with uh, enough room in the hosting package in terms of disk space and also bandwidth in case they, uh, they start seeing an uptake in traffic, which is hopefully what we're here for. Um, and also you want to make sure that there aren't too many strict guidelines and restrictions on stuff which sometimes won't be first apparent, such as the number of emails they can send from that server in a day, for example, in case they do want to then go and take on any other services that they might offer. And then I'm going to move on to possibly the main part of the presentation, which is the keyword research and how you go about doing that. All right, so keyword research. Uh, it's quite a big chunk of what I'm going to talk about today uh, because it's possibly the most important thing. It's the first thing that you need to look at and it's something that all of your other effort stems from. Um, so first up, I've got three things that I always think about when dealing with keyword research for client. The first thing is a question of relevance. So when you build this keyword list, which can be from anywhere from 20 to a couple of hundred keywords for the client, you need to think about whether the keyword is relevant to the content that they're going to have on the website, that they already have in the case of migration. Uh, you need to also think about value. So will the searchers actually find this content valuable on your website from the keyword that they use to search for? Um, so for example, you, you don't really want people coming through <coughs> to your website from a slightly related search. So for example, if you sell bikes, it might be interesting to have motorbikes. You might think, great, there's lots of search traffic for motorbikes. If you don't offer that, then it's kind of pointless. Um, and also you want to think about conversions. So will the traffic that these keywords generate provide any kind of conversion? Um, so these are the key three things that you need to think about when you're dealing with keywords, and they should inform everything that comes afterwards. So first up, relevance. Relevance is quite an important part, um, and there's four stages that I think about in regards to relevance. The first is, is this keyword directly relevant to any of the products or services that I provide? Um, these are probably your most important keywords, and uh, the ones that you really want to get right. Uh, the second thing is, do these keywords fit your business model? So you might have a keyword, for example, if you provide quotations for double glazing or plumbing, for example. If you don't actually offer free quotations, then you want to make sure that you're not actually targeting that kind of traffic and those keywords, because there's no point. The customers are just going to end up disappointed. Uh, you also need to think about whether the keywords that you're looking at fit your offering as a business. So whether you've got certain parts of your business that are premium services, you may well have actually a different set of keywords that you might not immediately think about in order to serve those clients. And you've also got to think about whether the keywords you're going to use are actually engaging the user and make them want to convert. Right, so value is something that I touched upon. Um, Relevance is important. The second most important thing that I've found in our experience is you want to bunch keywords into the, the higher and lower quality keywords. It's something that comes from experience, but it's also something that you can pick up on by looking at keywords that require or suggest an imminent action. So for example, we found that keywords surrounding actions like buy, or download, or view, or purchase, these kind of keywords are things that you should pay a lot of attention to because it suggests that the user, if they're searching for that, already have that process in their mind and they're much more likely to convert. And in regards to conversions, I know we understand there's many different types of conversions um, and it's a case of proving to your client that they will think about the bottom line as they're the business owner and you also need to consider that there are other types of conversions, not just purchases such as subscriptions to the newsletter, um, sharing your content on social networks, um, also linking to your content from other blogs or in reply in response to your content, and uh, obviously linking back to you, citing you as a reference, for example. And also if you manage to get users to log in to your website as a result of the keywords that you've been working with. Um, there are many other different types, but those are just the, fame, the five main ones that we tend to encounter. Alright, so keyword research. How do you actually go about it? First step is to think like the customer. Think like the consumer. And uh, what, what I mean by this is quite often the 
first step of keyword research is asking the client and getting them to ask their office or their business partners or anyone involved in the business for their set of keywords. They will usually provide you with a list that's very unique to them and they will be thinking about it from really up close and the words they use within the trade or within the business. But that's not always the best set of words to use. You also need to think about it from a wider scale about which kind of words the customers might actually be using to try and find their services, which is usually quite a large chunk and often quite different from the way that the business owner sees their business. Uh, the next step is actually brainstorming, getting all of these keywords together, discussing them with the client and working them up into a keyword list um, of keywords that you think will actually serve the customer's needs. Um, you then want to take these keywords and develop them break them down, segment them out into different products areas, different services, different levels, for example, and you then actually want to take these keywords and then use them in competitor analysis that I'm going to come on to, and then look at the amount of traffic they might generate and have a look and see whether you think they're already being very competitively used in the market or whether there might actually be a gap in the market and no one's actually using these keywords. So the next step after you've got these keywords, you've broken them out into the groups and you've kind of worked your way and you've got your set of words, it's always, a good, it's always a good idea to go back and review your first set of keywords and use tools such as Google AdWords um, Keyword Tool, it's brilliant for this, and also using the relevant searches uh, down the bottom of the Google listings is also quite useful and obviously looking at your competitors. To build up that list again with things you might not have thought about originally, such as of misspellings, abbreviations, or synonyms, so basically different, different words that mean the same thing. Uh, once you've got this, you then want to go away and break that list down into an even smaller group for each of the areas and work through um, using tools that allow you to, um, to look at competitiveness, uh, such as uh, SEO mods, which is quite useful. Um, but also stuff like Market Samurai, which is a, a brilliant tool that we use on quite a regular basis to really look at those keywords and work out whether you think they're achievable uh, within, the, within the time frame that you've got, within the kind of time scales that you presented to the client. Um, for example, there's no point in taking a website that's reasonably new, especially in the case of a startup, and aiming to try and get it to rank for in the first page of some of the most highly competitive keywords such as web design. It's just not going to happen. Um, it's much better to try and find the longer tail keywords such as Joomla Web Design or even Joomla Web Design London, Kent, uh, Netherlands or even sort of smaller areas for example. And actually use those aim to build trust with the client to achieve those kind of rankings before you then move on to try and improve your higher traffic rankings. Once you've got those keywords, you also then want to think about some of the other things, as I've been mentioning, like the budget. Is it achievable in, in your time frame? Have you got enough man hours to commit to the job? Uh, once you've done that, you will then want, you will then effectively have, in this diagram, it's quite a nice little machine with a spout on. Um, what, what effectively you have after that analysis is a set of final keywords that you and the client have signed off on, which you can then sit down and begin the development work and begin, begin the optimization process with. <coughs> And just in case uh, anyone isn't familiar with the Google AdWords keyword tool, uh, this, is, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, as an aside, the way that I tend to do it is, the most important thing is sign in with an active AdWords account, um, because that removes the restrictions for the number of keywords you can put in, and the number you can download and save as a spreadsheet. Uh, so I tend to put all of my grouped keywords in at the top here, and then uh, make sure you set it to the exact match type, and then produce your list with uh, closely related items so in the language and locations that you want that are relevant to your client and just basically work through those lists, put them into the spreadsheets, work through them and repeatedly go through them and refine them. It's quite a long-winded process but it will pay off, I can assure you. Okay, so once you've got those keywords, the final list that I was talking about, the next step is to look at how competitive those keywords are, how are you going to achieve that first page ranking. Um, and I suggest the first couple of times you do it, if you're not familiar with it, it's best to do it manually, um, which is basically, is as it sounds, uh, get the keyword, 
put it into your favorite search engines or the three or four search engines you're looking at. Um, actually take those top 10 competitors on the first page, 20 if you're feeling really, really, really busy and enthusiastic, uh, and actually have a look and analyze those websites as they are effectively your competition and see how many, see how many people you think it's going to be by looking at how many domains they have linked into them, to that page in particular, and also to the whole website as a whole. Uh, you also want to look at where they're getting their links from. And again, as I mentioned, Market Samurai is a really good tool for this. Um, actually try and work out whether you think getting on that first page is a cheat. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a screen grab from the SEO Monster tool, uh, which is really useful, provides you with good stats, the kind of thing that you can take to a client who will understand those kind of figures and graphs, rather than you giving them a, a spreadsheet with lots of different figures and numbers of linking root domains, for example. Uh, this is actually part of their um, paid tools system, but you can actually get a uh, free trial for SEO Moz at the moment, and uh, I suggest you try to use that to your advantage. It's fantastic, and it will save you a lot of time. It's the first couple you want to do it manually, so you've got a good idea of your market area. Okay, so having undertaken your keyword analysis, got your list of keywords, had a look at your competitors, worked out which keywords you're going to target for the market area, um, you then need to consider how you would do this for an existing website. How would you migrate this? <coughs> the, way, the way that you think about this is you've got your research that you need to do, either for a startup or for migration. You then need to look at putting this into practice in an existing website. Obviously, for a brand new one, you can do it as you wish. First things to consider um, are domain consolidations. If, you're, if your client's got lots and lots of different domains, uh, you want to try and make sure that you're forwarding them all to one domain and uh, you want to make sure that you're using the domain that already pre-exists. It's a good idea not to change domains uh, because that can cause you lots of problems and headaches in the long run. Uh, the next thing is to think about when you're going to launch the redesigned or redeveloped website. Um, it's very important that you understand your client's business model uh, and to make sure that if there's any seasonality in their, in their search trends and their business practices, the, idea, the ideal time to launch a new site is obviously in their low period, uh, when there's going to be less traffic to the website. Um, the reason for this is because regardless of how good your best practice is, uh, rankings and traffic do tend to take a bit of a hit after any redevelopment. Um, as Google takes another search engine to take a little while to adjust to the obvious changes that have been made to the architecture of the site. Uh, the, the other thing, just on the side, is staff availability is obviously quite important. Uh, as, a, as a mainly in-house team for us, that's not a huge consideration, but we have had clients in other countries and other time zones, which makes it very frustrating and difficult uh, if you haven't thought about this ahead of time to make sure you've got everyone in one room effectively to, to work through any teething problems that you might have as a result of the launch. Right, now on to the actual audit of the website itself. Uh, I suggest you undertake this at the beginning before you actually start any development work. Uh, reason being that if you're armed with all this information before you start, it should take less time to complete and should give you a better idea of exactly where you can improve things. Um, these are basically the three areas that I work through uh, when we're given a website that we need to redevelop or redesign. Um, the first part is having a look at the site structure. Um, in in Joomla's case, this is obviously having a look at the, so the sections and categories, or in K2, just the categories, and um, the tags as well would be important and making sure that you've got all your bases covered for your products. And obviously talking about search engine friendly URLs and uh, seeing how you can improve things there um, if they haven't got any at all, or if they've got existing ones that aren't quite doing what you want to do. Uh, the next part is obviously accessibility. Um, there's several things there that I'm going to talk about. And I'll finally finish up with uh, on-page optimization. So first up, the site URL or and structure. Um, I would say Take a look at the existing sections and categories in the website for the Joomla site, or have a look at the broad structure of things if it's from a different platform. Uh, take your keyword list that you've carefully organized and developed and spend a lot of time on, uh, and actually see whether there's areas of the site that you can improve. Um, the main thing you think about here is the hierarchy of the site. You ideally want just one page per product if it's an e-commerce website, and ideally in the best world, you'd want probably one or two keywords focusing on that page for that product. 
that, that's not going to happen very often, and if it does, it makes your job a lot easier. But it's always important to think, how can I best apply that idea um, to my sections and categories, and ultimately the article pages as well. I want to make sure that that keyword theme runs through the whole process. Um, I'd say you want to make sure that they're keyword rich. By this I don't mean the old practice of just putting 50 keywords into an article title or a section or category to try and make things work. It's never going to happen. But if you do have one or two words that the previous architecture, the previous design didn't use and you feel irrelevant from your research, I'd suggest you include them. I'd also suggest that you try and make sure that the article titles on the individual pages are as optimised as they possibly can be, um, taking your main keywords for those, for those products, for example, and using those either in the title, but most definitely in the, uh, in the body and in the other attachments that we'll get to in a minute. Do you mind if I ask a question? Yeah, sure, go for it. Um, isn't it true that uh, they actually set the URLs are created by the menu structure of your Joomla site, not the section category? specifically by the aliases? Yes, um, I'd say for, I tend to use SH404 um, for most of our websites, which will take it from, they build the URL from the section and the category aliases. But yeah, you're right, if, if you're using if you're using the core SCF, uh, you want to make sure that the, the menus are organized as well. Is there a length, a maximum length, for self-optimization? Um, there have been studies performed um, on URL length, and it's generally, the rule of thumb is the shorter the better. Um, not necessarily for the results pages, but definitely for conversions, which is the ultimate goal. Um, people have said that you probably don't want more than about 150 characters maximum in the, in the URL, is, is what I've heard suggested. Um, but to be honest, I'd say if you've got a very complex site, you might need the sections in the URL, if you can avoid it, I to try and limit it to the category and then the article page title. If you have content which you can find with multiple search queries, like I'm in the travel industry, so you can say trip or tour or stuff like that, would it be good to add those kind of keywords into the URL? Um, it, it can do. Um, again, the, the URL is important. The most important thing is the title of the page. The URL is important, um, but it would be better to include those in the, in the body copy and possibly one or two of the main ones in the title. But obviously, it's, really correct. it's not a case anymore of just putting them all in there and ignoring users. But yeah, they can help, but it, you need to think about them quite carefully. Um, and as I say, in regards to Joomla, uh, I, I'm a big fan of the breadcrumbs module. I find that helps quite a lot, being able to make sure that um, users and search engine spiders can actually get backwards and forwards between the different pages on your site and in between the different sections and categories and menus, um, and that's something that can also help, especially if it appears, if you put it in your design, if that happens to be the first thing on the page to one of your sections and categories, or your menu, uh, that can actually help you with your rankings. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, I tend to use it for 404. Um, we've been using it for quite a while now, and it's called... The whole thing is down on, I know, it's come on leaps and bounds, uh, and it's, uh, it's improving all the time. So, I remember using it in the version 1 sites uh, when it was definitely in beta. Um, and now it's, uh, we've been using it for about a year since it became a paid component. Um, and uh, I found working with it is, is, is easy. Uh, I, I find it very, very powerful in what it can do. Um, but here are my settings. Now, again, these are just what I found useful. If anyone else has any thoughts about them, please feel free to have a chat at the end and we can try and work it through. Uh, I tend to make sure that all the links, all the URLs are lowercase uh, because they can cause problems depending on which platform you're on with uh, uppercase letters in the URLs. Um, uh, I find that it's just safer to go lowercase. It also tends to look nicer because it's uniform. And clients are, even if you're well practiced and you're well organized, clients are usually pretty poor at uh, making sure things are standardized. So that saves you one hassle. Uh, I always like to use the mod rewrite or the .ht access uh, method of rewriting. Uh, reason being, it solves your problem with index.php, it makes your URL shorter, and it also means that you can actually use that .ht access file to do all kinds of other things. Do you ever have to roll these items on Windows servers? We we haven't we haven't done no, but obviously in that case that wouldn't be that wouldn't be a viable option.
No, I mean, we were just discussing with Microsoft how to better support for rewriting the site. Uh, we've we've, yeah. used, uh, we've looked at a couple of sites that we actually ended up redeveloping, and we've had a poke around in them. And yeah, we, we have a couple which we thought about, it, but we, we never actually rolled that out for anyone. Um, and basically, in regards to the extensions, uh, as I said earlier, sections and categories can be useful to show in the URL, especially if you've got a massive site uh, which has lots and lots of different products in many different categories. It can often help to have that section <coughs> showing. I tend to leave it just the category, so it makes it shorter and neater. Uh, in regards to security, uh, I tend to switch it on, but turn off the anti flood <coughs> running bot, purely to uh, save any problems of clients phoning up and saying my website's not working. Uh, you can tweak the anti flood if you want to to, uh, to improve that. But usually when you're testing, I, I definitely haven't turned off. Uh, in regards to the SEO side of things within SH404, I tend to switch this off if I'm using a standard Joomla site, and I tend to use some other plugins to deal with the metadata and the titles of the pages. Um, if I'm using K2, uh, which the other plugins I use don't work with, um, I actually, we usually say to clients, what are you happy doing? Um, you either show them the page in Message 404 where they can do all of that, or you uh, show them the area and the parameters where they can also fill out the data. Um, so that's, a, that's then up to client choice. Uh, and I'd say the other thing is with the 404 page, um, I find Message 404's 404 page is great with the URL suggestions in case they're coming from a page they can't find that's relevant. They say, would you like to have a look at any of these other pages that might help you? Uh, I also tend to add to that by using a low position. Uh, to load the search box module into the 404 page, just in case none of those suggestions are relevant, relevant to the user, they can actually search directly in the site for what they want. Um, having said that, if you're not using SH404, uh, you can quite easily build the, uh, the standard 404 page with that search box functionality. Then it might be uh, interesting to test the uh, dynamic 404 from Nigeria. It prevents you coming on a 404 page. Okay. If you make a typo, it searches for the correct URL and then uh, directs you directly uh, with a 301 <coughs> redirect to the correct page. Using the, uh, using the alternative URL. Uh, the only thing I do want to say about SH404, I like it, we use it on most of our sites. Uh, it can, if you've got huge sites, uh, especially if you're doing any clearing out or viewing any of the logs or doing lots of different redirects um, and setting up aliases you may want to just keep an eye on the server usage. <coughs> Having said that, with the admin overhead, what I mean by that is with SH404, if you've got clients that are actively managing the site, uh, who tend to like to change articles, delete articles, recycle old ones without changing the aliases, or turn menus on or off randomly, uh, as they're prone to do, uh, you may sometimes get them phoning you up and saying all their menus or modules have disappeared, and that's just something that you have to bear in mind. It will be a case of duplicate URLs usually within the framework. Okay, now moving on to the second part of the migration, the accessibility. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, uh, which I'm sure a few of you will know about, is uh, the fact that the robots.txt in general, uh, standard from Juno, actually blocks uh, robots access to the images folder. Um, which means, of course, you may notice that some of the sites that you build don't do very well for Google image search. Um, that will usually be the main reason, uh, aside from Another, another uh, line in the, in the robots.txt, some people uh, put a menu item called media. Yes. Uh, uh, media is also in the robots file. Yes. So, uh, uh, and again, it, it depends how you, how you, use, the, um, how you use the folders. Um, I, know, I know for some of our clients, they put all of their banners um, within the banners folder in the media. And no, 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 I, I mean the menu item. Media. Yeah, and, and then some menu item like a photo, or video, or, or something like that. Again, there's a system folder with a menu with the same name that causes problems. So you'll probably notice the, the, the 404 page or the complete, <laughs> complete meltdown. Um, yeah. That's something that's important. There are other things that you can do with robots.txt, but I thought that's probably the most useful to mention. Um, in regards to sitemaps, <coughs> they're really important. Um, clients don't tend to understand exactly what they are or what they do. Um, some of them mixed up like a Google map of their site, we've had before, which is always quite funny. Uh, in regards to sitemaps in Juno, uh, we tend to use XMAP, 
just because it's actively developed and uh, it's got a useful plugin for K2. So if you're ever doing any K2 work, um, you'll want to search out the K2 plugin for XMAP, uh, as XMAP out of the box doesn't do K2 items. Uh, it also does news and image sitemaps, uh, which can be quite useful. And again, K2 has an extra new sitemap plugin that you'll need. Uh, sitemaps also, if you're using Junefish uh, or any other multi language tool, I believe, uh, you can actually create multilingual sitemaps by adding the uh, adding a parameter, the question mark lang equals, and then whatever you're whatever you're using. So, for example, en or de onto the end of your site will actually provide you with a list of the multi-language pages, which again can be useful for putting into Google Webmaster Tools if you've got other localised searches going on on the site. Um, and in regards to metadata, I'd say the global settings page is important. Um, obviously getting your description correct in there is, is useful. Uh, keywords are not so important. And again, the title of the site is very, very important. Um, that's something that you'd work through with the, uh, with the client to discuss the balance between getting their brand name in there um, and providing any of the main keyword tools, any of the main keywords that you want into the title of the website. Uh, in regards to K2 sites for the metadata, uh, I tend to use the site title plugin, which has been around for years now, um, to change and uh, update the title of the site. Uh, and I then, again, I use SH404 for the uh, metadata or the parameters on the right hand side of the article we use. Uh, for non K2 sites, I use a plugin called SEO Simple, which I find is a, is a really great tool, um, which I'll show you a screenshot of in a second. Okay, so this is, I don't know if you can see that, if that's clear enough, but this is a, this is a screenshot of the plugin we use called SEO Simple, uh, which again is, is available from the, the JED and is, uh, is free for, for use. Um, what this does is it sorts the HR problem of the page title and the site title being the wrong way around. You've got several different options there. You can have the site title here before the page title. You can do whatever you want there. It just gives you more flexibility in standard Gmail. And it also allows you to specify a completely separate optional front page title for the site that will display uh, in the search engines. But the client would still see their original branded brand name in the, in the actual Joomla site title. So if you've got a client that's completely adamant, they only want their brand name, or they only want their company name, as the site title, when they're looking around administering the back end of the website, even if you said to them that's not going to happen in search engines, you can actually set, specify an optional front page title on the right hand side there, and then just change the front page layout to the optional title, and you can put your full search engine optimized title in, which the, the search engines will use, and your client will never know, they can just carry on happily just seeing their company name in there, which is useful because it's one of the barriers you can come across. Um, and again, you can choose whether to generate the metadata. As standard, the component generates uh, the plugin generates the metadata and grabs the first paragraph of each article automatically and places that into the metadata area of the source code, which is very useful to save you having to send your client off or doing it yourself, going to every article, filling out the metadata area. This plugin will actually do that automatically and use the first paragraph for you, which can be quite a which can be quite a time saver. And again, you can choose whether you want to credit the original developers or not. Okay, now my final part for the migration, uh, for actual auditing uh, site you want to migrate, is uh, on-page optimization. Again, this is a screen grab from SEO Moz, which shows you a potentially perfectly optimized page. Uh, and this is always something to think about and have a look at, especially when you've inherited a website from a, a, a different development house who may not have always thought about those things uh, ahead of time, gives you a good chance to work on them. Uh, obviously the most important thing is the title page. It's one of the other most important things are dealing with the keywords that are developed actually in the copy themselves. Uh, it's not so important these days to have them everywhere, hundreds of them or densities are less important now, but at least as long as you're showing them in the actual copy on the site, in the article page that's useful. Uh, and I'd say the next important things are the file names and the images. As you're redeveloping the site, you can change those and do what you want with those. But you've got to be careful, obviously, if they are getting good image search traffic or are having people link directly to gallery pages, for example, that you, uh, you make sure that you don't change those too much or at least redirect them to a creative article page, if not with the image themselves. 
Um, and then, of course, if you want to make sure you've got the right author attributes on the images, which is always been done from the back of the um, And it's all these things, all small percentile increases that are effort that can help develop your rankings over time as a complete process. Doing each of these things won't be a magic bullet, but combining them all together can help you. Um, and again, uh, you want to look at your internal link structure uh, when you get the chance to work through all of the pages for the migrated site. Once you've done that, you've wanted to do your site, you've got everything you need organised, you then need to undertake the daunting task of redirecting all of the old links in the site that aren't relevant anymore, or due to any architecture or structure changes that you've made, or even if they clients decided with a new design, they've thrown out all of the old stuff, they've got completely new copy, completely new articles. You need to make sure that you've got articles and areas of this the new site that are actually representative and cover all of the old articles <coughs> in the site because you don't want people coming onto four or four pages for something that they really wanted to buy, for example, if you just change the name of the product slightly. Uh, the first thing to do is to contact, I'd say look at your analytics, contact the top referrers over say the last six months or so, actually proactively let them know where the new pages are um, because it means that you can actually open up a dialogue there with them for further link building in the future. It shows you're proactive, and it also means that those links are, are actually more valuable than 301 redirects by a small margin. Um, if you can't do that, or they're not responsive, you need to undertake the task of making sure you've redirected all the old pages to the new areas of the website. Uh, I tend to do this with a combination of HD access redirects um, or creating aliases for the new pages uh, in SH404. Or indeed, I know some people are probably using 1.6 to, to varying degrees of success. There's actually a redirect tool in Jira 1.6 that you can use to do this. Um, the next thing is to make sure that you've settled on whether you're using www dot or non www dot. Uh, reason for this is if you don't do it at a if you don't do it at DNS level, uh, you can actually cause both versions of your site to appear in the search engines, um, and then you're effectively competing with yourself, which is an ideal. Um, so the most relevant, or the most useful one, or the most popular one now is to use it without www. Um, it's just, but it's a case of choosing between yourselves which one you'd like to use. Um, it got mentioned yesterday, um, on the ferry over here, that how would you go about dealing with redirecting links with parameters? Um, my advice is, you actually want to try and strip back if you can, analyse the links that you've got, strip back the parameters, take out any that aren't relevant that you can do without, um, and then see if you can actually simplify your task. I would like to add some uh, uh, point number six. Uh, you can use the webmaster tool from Google yeah. to, to add uh, the new URL yeah. and the 301 redirection on that. So that's basically that's another, another option for redirecting. Yeah. Yeah. And again, in Google Webmaster Tools, you can actually uh, specify and remove um, parameters if you need to, and get Google to ignore those if, if they're not relevant. Uh, having said that, it is a case of sitting down and working through uh, with whoever in your office that's not yourself is your uh, is your HD access whiz um, with regular expressions and, and whatnot. Uh, actually, working out a plan of making it as easy as you can to redirect most of those links. If you can't do all of them. You've mentioned that non-www is more popular than with these days? Uh, it, it is for, it tends to be the, the choice of websites um, increasingly now, especially seeing as um, Chrome quite often, Chrome I notice sometimes drops it off entirely uh, when, you're, when you're browsing around. Um, I know the standard is www dot and it's what people always used. Um, to be honest, it doesn't matter, it's a case of whichever one you want to go with, as long as you choose one over the other. Um, and again, the most important, the next point is you need to monitor this progress of redirection um, using a combination of error logs, SH404, 404 pages, and good webmaster tools. After you've made sure you've got that sorted and organised, um, you want to make sure that you've got the content. Organize. I tend to make sure that I've got a backup of the old site that's still live and doesn't need to refer to. Um, I also make sure that I've got the tracking code migrated across or made a decision to start completely fresh. Um, and again, 
I've already talked about updating the metadata and um, also you then need to look at the internal link structure of the site and see where you can improve that. Uh, page rank sculpting is a bit controversial. Uh, I believe that um, you don't really want to do that with no follow links anymore, but you want to do it using your main menu structures um, and your categories and internal links. And the fourth one page I've already mentioned. Okay, so once you've got all of that done, uh, just a quick mental checklist to make sure you've done everything you need to. Uh, I've called it finishing touches here. Is uh, keeping on those error logs and the progress of your, your migration. Uh, I'd say check the Webmaster Tools daily. Um, again, the analytics, if not daily, every couple of days, and the 404 logs are important, and the error logs are very, very important to keep an eye on. Um, I would also say make sure that if you've, once you've got your analytics migrated, make sure you've got any of the tracking goals or any of the specific insights, if you're using Google Analytics, or any of the particular alerts that you had set up on the old account. My great is the new one with the new addresses. Um, I then sit down with the guys and uh, work out if there are any components still on the site or any plugins in the site that we definitely don't need and will never need and haven't used as part of the design process and tend to undertake a bit of a Weight Watchers program on that and take out all of the old plugins and extensions and components that we don't need anymore. Um, we then check the site's all still working and we then usually switch on caching um, unless there's a specific reason not to. Um, and I then refer, I refer to Jordan, our head developer, to actually work through optimizing the JavaScript and CSS libraries if they haven't already done so. And uh, we to use Minify or pieces of the boilerplate template, which is uh, readily available. And the final part is just to have a look, again, refer to Jordan and see if we can actually make sprites to combine the images together to make things load a bit quicker and use, uh, if we've got particular, particularly troublesome images, use certain such as Yahoo, smash it um, and pay, white page slow and stuff like that to make sure we're getting the most we can out of the client hosting space. Alright, so just to summarise, um, been through keyword research, why it's important, why you should spend quite a lot of your time doing that and how that then affects the rest of your development process. I uh, had a quick look at the why you need to do market research and look at the competitors. Reason being that if you're a new web, if you're a completely new build, a completely new <coughs> startup business, your competitors may have been around for a fair bit longer than you. They probably will have already done most of this work, and you can use certain tools to find out what kind of work they've been doing, such as Market Samurai. Um, you then need to make sure you've got a site or bit of the existing site completed, so you know exactly what you're dealing with. Not only does it make things quicker when you're redeveloping, but it also gives you something you can give to your client to say, look, here is where we're at. This is your existing site. This is how we're going to improve it. These are the problems we've inherited. This is why it's taken long to do this, long to do that, or this is why it's not, we're not able to do these things. Um, and then I've just run through quickly uh, our processes of actually migrating content and URLs across. And uh, I'll run through quickly a couple of extra common sense things to check. <coughs> and uh, just before I ask any questions, I'm just going to leave that up there for you as a, a list of some of the tools in case you didn't get them uh, that we use. Will this presentation be on site yet? Or? Uh, I can put it on there if you'd like me to. Yeah, that's not a problem at all. Great. But just a question about alt text in case you would like to move. Have you got any tricks for the customers? I find that. So you know, the file names, because they're um, hashes and then they're, 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 they're already automatically created, you can't actually change the file names. Um, we tend to use the, the captions. It's not, it's not ideal. I haven't really got any specific yeah. tips and tricks for that, I'm afraid. Okay. Another quick one, I forget, but the SEO is simple. Yes. Do you have a preference if the client insists on having their company name in, on every page title? Yeah. Is it preferable? Push it to the background. Yes, yeah, it is. As it, as it tends to be site wide, um, it's always it's a better idea to put it at the end. And um, I tend to go page or product, category, or section, and then, then the actual subtitle. Again, it's great because you can actually give the client, when they log in to administer if they do it from the back end, they can actually see just their company name up there. They're, they're perfectly happy, it's nice and tidy, and you can actually use it to create an optional title for the actual search engines. 
And so yeah, it's a great, it's a great tool. I'm not sure if it's okay for 1.6 at the moment, but unfortunately it doesn't work with K2. No, well, that's a killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah find other ways. Great, and... <laughs>